begin the staff meeting this morning. Thank you all for being there. Being here. I'm there too. I'm also here. Something like that. I'm pretty talking about devil worshiping. Well, I've, uh, I've been gone for a while to colorful Colorado. I just got back, and, and uh, so I got a lot of catching up to do. But um, yes, you all will help me do that. slow now until Sheriff okay. gets it. All right. Um, Commissioners, before we get started, anything urgent to go before we talk? Okay. Then, Mr. Manager, do you have a presentation? Well, yeah, we got a couple of presentations. Uh, we're going to let uh, Tim talk about uh, the uh, the Sedgwick County Park and the new uh, art um, exhibit that's going to be set up in, in the park. We're going to talk about that. And also, the sheriff is going to get here momentarily and talk about mental health issues. Okay. Uh, so, uh, one thing I want to bring up is uh, last night uh, our firefighters did get back uh, from Texas. Um, they were released yesterday and in route uh, and got back in about about midnight or so last night. I know uh, Chief League told me, uh, texted me when they had just about got to the the uh, state line. So they uh, they got in last night and it's great to have them back. How big of a unit did we send down to how many folks? We sent four. Uh, but it was a part of the uh, Kansas strike team or task force five that went down there um, uh, As part of a multi-county region. I don't know how many were total part of that task force Okay, and we were four of 14 oh, Okay, all right David. Uh, I heard on the news this morning that uh, the vehicle lost two tires in Waco on the way back How did we send them down with? vehicle that had bad tires uh, I mean uh, clearly they operated in that uh, devastated area for the whole week I'm sure they picked up something down there I, I doubt or seriously they went down there in a in a bad vehicle but I think it was more related to the the devastated area and what they were driving through down there uh, to get to is kind of <coughs> odd so I'm, I'm sure they drove through something but uh, but I can give you get you a report on on what the cause was. But you know they're the um, you know they're actually in the vehicles are in pretty good shape. So I, I'm, it's more probably related to the area. I, I figured that we had real good enough vehicle. We're going to send somebody all the way to Texas to do that with. But then suddenly I heard yeah. on the news this morning that they lost two tires in Waco. Also pull, pulling the uh, the the boats. So. And have extra weight on it too. But we'll get your report on what happened exactly and why it happened. But good to have them back safe and sound. All right, uh, without further ado, I'll let uh, Tim talk to us a little bit about Central County Park. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, we've talked about this project a couple of different times, but I just wanted to bring it up one more time because we're really close to the next step. Next week on the agenda, we should have two different contracts that will uh, initiate work on the turtle noise project as it's referred to. This project goes back to 2010. It was initiated by Bob Lampke working with the Arts Council at that point in time and designated the area that is just north of 13th Street between some zoo property <coughs> east of the entrance at Prince Sedgwick County Park. Um, it's an undeveloped field right now as uh, property and land for an environmental art park and it, in, it initiated a partnership with the Arts Council where they would identify appropriate art projects and um, approve the art that would then be installed in that art park area and so I'll have uh, projects I'll have two contracts for you next week to review um, the artist Terry Corbett work has been working with the Arts Council since 2010 to identify funding for this particular project. Some funding has been identified. And um, I've been working with both the artist and Martha Lindsmere from the Arts Council. She's president of the Arts Council for a number of months to get the details worked out. But what we'll have on the agenda will be two different contracts. One will be with the Arts Council to, and they're gonna act as the fiduciary party in this project, help 
they'll gather the money, do the fundraising, collect the money, they'll pass it on to us, and then we'll contract with vendors to install the art project. So there'll be a contract with the Arts Council for them to grant us money, and then there'll be a contract where we expend that money with um, a contractor who will do the, the artwork, install the artwork project. Um, Artistic Stonework is the contractor that will be doing the work, and the, this will be the initial installation. There are, if you can remember, five different um, projects that are planned or proposed for this. And the belief is that by getting this first turtle maze project installed, it will help with fundraising for future projects. When people see that the, the art park is up and running and working, um, they believe that they'll be able to generate additional fundraising more quickly through that process. And so they've got phase two. Um, Beginning stages of the implementation and installation, that's where we're at. And uh, I think it's going to be a nice project for that particular piece of ground. It's pretty interesting. This turtle is a pretty inter interesting piece of artwork, about 120 feet by 90 feet, that will rise to an elevation of about five feet. Um, but it'll be an opportunity for kids to experience art, adults and kids to experience art firsthand. So, will, will each piece of the whole Art garden or whatever is, is they all kind of uh, working together under the same theme or one one thing or one something totally different. They're all um, nature uh, animal related. You can recognize right now that my art, my background is not necessarily in art, but these are um, art. They are nature related. The the next uh, install installation would be a fossil, fish fossil um, art piece that would be s similar in scale to this turtle maze, about 120 feet long approximately. So they're all animal nature related projects. And how big is the space that we're going to dedicate to allow them to use there? Is it two acres? Or I cannot tell you the answer right now, but I would think that's very really much enough. And in our, um, our responsibilities maintenance but is it is it does this create additional maintenance or is it just same stuff just more around this this is the the design is uh, done with low maintenance in mind so Mark's uh, park staff will they mow that plot of ground anyhow they'll be able to do use the same mower they'll just work around it and then my last question when we first started talking about this <coughs> ten years ago there was, I got contacted by constituents who thought we were putting up some sort of a pagan worship site. Well, my background isn't in pagan worship sites <laughs> either, but I'm pretty sure that, that, that there's no pagan worship involved in this. Again, I think that everything that I've seen ties to animals. You know, there will be the turtle, the fish. I know one of the, the pieces intended is a wall that will have paintings um, of buffaloes on it. There's, there's awesome. sundials or something going to be out there, and people can go out and watch the sun come through the things. And I'll get back to okay. on that. Well, I told them that was not our intent, that and we weren't going to do that. I didn't know what was going up either. I just said, no, we're not doing that. So. Okay. Are we going to have a groundbreaking ceremony or a ribbon cutting at the end or anything? Do you know? It's an interesting question. I think that's a good idea, and we probably should have something. I'll work with the Arts Council, but have some kind of a, uh, probably an introduction ceremony when it's completed. Okay. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Anybody have a question? Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, well, a couple of things. First off, we found out it wasn't a Cedric County vehicle that, that lost the two tires. That's good. It was the Manhattan Fire vehicle. So, uh, The second thing, while we still wait for uh, Sheriff Easter, the different uh, staff meeting topics that we're going to have in September. Uh, today we'll do the mental health. Next week we're going to cover the fleet maintenance life cycle uh, re uh, replacement plan. Uh, for large uh, large equipment, 
Uh, that will that will be next uh, Tuesday's meeting, um, and uh, I'm very happy with where that's going to be and and the savings that we're going to see from that and the process that we're going to have in place for that. So look forward to unveiling that next week uh, on the 12th, and then uh, and then also we'll talk about uh, the different functional um, program transfers that the city of Wichita. Uh, based off of uh, some collaboration between me and Bob and, and trying to uh, look for opportunities uh, to uh, realign, create some efficiency and effectiveness based off of some program transfers. If you remember, we just did the HUD, uh, sent that over to the city, and, and, and uh, in exchange also we're going to get some from the city of Wichita. We're doing the analysis right now to make sure that um, it makes sense, uh, and we should have something for you on the 12th uh, for that. There will be no meeting on the 19th uh, because, if you remember, that's the city to city trip. And then on the 5th, uh, which is uh, on a Wednesday, we don't have a BOCC meeting, so instead, we're going to do a workshop, and that's where we'll cover the senior center funding. Uh, as well as uh, WEBA and SCED, um, we'll, we'll cover those three topics uh, on Wednesday, September 27th, uh, and that'll fill out the month pretty good. Uh, so, any questions on that? Thanks for getting that workshop scheduled. Right, perfect. I am. Um, if if I could ask Tim another question on if, if the Sheriff's coming in to talk about mental health issues and so forth. I guess they might have, what what do we uh, what do we know? What are we doing? What's our response? How big is the problem of this opioid crisis? And, and um, I know it's not directly mental health, but it's substance abuse. And uh, every time you pick up the paper, every time you read anything, they they warn that this is a, a big issue. And I don't know how much it's hit our area and what we're doing about education preparation. It is, a, it is a growing issue and concern. We still have problems. The primary problems in this community still are um, alcohol, marijuana, and methamphetamines. But opioids are becoming more and more problematic in our community. <coughs> Things happen here a little bit slower than they happen on either coast. And that's true with the opioid issue as well. The sheriff has um, formed a work group that is looking at this at that topic as well. And Adrian just came back from some training that the state put on a week ago in Topeka. She was there with the, with people from across the state addressing um, this particular topic. It's a public health issue. It's a behavioral health issue. It kind of depends on across the country. It depends on how your health department is configured and where mental health if mental health sits inside of a health department or is independent in Kansas. It's independent in some states. It's embedded, and so you, you see a lot of different um, conferences and that sort of thing that are related to this opioid topic. It touches law enforcement. It touches behavioral health. It touches public health, and so we've got a, a task force in the community that's working on that um, to try and make sure that we're prepared for what's coming. I know that there have been a number of questions that have gone to the Regional Forensic Science Center to see if they can identify how many um, overdose death overdose deaths are attributed to that. Um, it's tough to tell because the, the chemical heroin um, transforms itself after, after a fairly short period of time in the morphine, and so it's difficult to tell. I just saw something over the weekend that said that fentanyl is now the, um, in the most recent year, it's surpassed all other drugs as the primary opioid that deaths are attributed to, and so it's a fast-moving topic, and so we've got some people that are doing a lot of study and research on it and making sure that we can address it as best we can. <coughs> Comcare and, and the Addiction Treatment Service treats people with addiction to opioids as well as a number of other substances, and so we've got that treatment experience in-house. We continue to work with um, funders because the newest ways in terms of treatment for opioid addiction is Medicaid-assisted treatment, or MAT, 
and we've got some funding from the Kansas Health Foundation <coughs> to do some of that work here in the community. Um, one of the big concerns is that there's very little funding for um, opioid treat for addiction treatment in any type, um, but uh, we're working with foundations to try and help fund because if you're going to use a psychiatrist to prescribe those medications, it's really expensive treatment to do. And so we've identified a couple of different funding sources, and we've got a pilot program going right now in terms of medication treatment for individuals with addiction issues. Okay. Well, the, <clears throat> the spike in the, in the jail population is not due to opioid, opioid issues, at least not at this time. Is that I don't think so. The sheriff can address that more, but I don't, I don't believe that's going to be causing what we're seeing in the jail right now. It may be a part of it, but... Well, it just seems like if this is um, going to hit us and it's got a, you know, a fiscal note attached to it, I'm, I'm glad we're trying to get ahead of it. But between that and the jail population as it is right now anyway, we've got a couple of <coughs> potential problems that... You know, some some things you can't do anything about, but it, if we can't, then we it's it's a it's a problem with finances and, and funding. So I also asked uh, Wes uh, in IT. Uh, there's uh, several GIS products out there that uh, map the crisis, and you can potentially see it unfold. Um, and he is actually researching that right now. Um, I had gotten uh, some sort of uh, article uh, from, I think, GIS Magazine that kind of talked her through this, and he's looking at that right now as a, as a means for us to have a pictorial understanding of, of how severe the crisis is. And certainly it's, it's, more, it's very severe out east, and it's slowly kind of moving this way. Okay. Well, if we're... Yeah, okay, go ahead, Richard. Tim, are you aware of this idea or thought? I think it's relatively new. With the, about the Medicaid expansion is exacerbating or contributing to this. Are you aware of that? Has that task force looked at that? Do you know? I have not seen anything on that, and I don't know that. I don't know that they they're really not looking at. I think that type of funding, even if Medicaid were to, to expand, there's just not a lot of money in Medicaid for addiction treatment. Oh, talk about Medicaid expansion. Right. Is exacerbating the opioid problem. I haven't seen it. <coughs> I need to send you something. Yeah, I'd like um, to see it's that. It's just kind of recent. I'm trying to well, see if, if there's true, this correlation. is true. There's a correlation, apparently, in states that have Medicaid expansion. The problem is, is twice as it's bad, and uh, it just, I, I will, and just want to know if you'd heard anything. I gotta keep your okay. eyes and ears out if you hear anything. I want to, I want to be able to read it and sift through the. From the know. pharmaceutical <laughs> side of things, or uh, from the pharmaceutical supply side of things, I'm just. How it, it, yes. Because there's two kinds of opioid problem. There's the pharmaceutical side, and then there's just the illegal street drug, fentanyl, and heroin. But I. I have not seen anything on that either. And I had to go back and read again. Yeah, increase access, and of course, some of it can then get sold on the streets. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, <coughs> some structuring of things of, of how drug reimbursement works and incentivizes it. Yeah, it had to, I'll send it to you. You can read it. It's just, you know, just wanted. Be aware if that's true because I, I, I think it, I could be getting over ahead a few questions. I want to be able to say yes, it's true or it's not true. Or I think right now it's kind of people are looking into this. It's probably in the early phase. I probably can't say definitively yes or no one or the other. But I might mention also Pastor Dave Bolton is very uh, interested in this topic. In case any of you hear from him, uh, he is going to work with the sheriff on this uh, task force effort. So you'll have some. Uh, some church uh, and private uh, entities that will be involved in this as well, which it, it needs to happen. It needs to be a community-wide response. So, well, while we're waiting for the sheriff, shall we go ahead and see if commissioners have anything to ask? Any, add anything? I have one. Oh, okay, Jim. I'm sorry. I think oh, you started right there. Uh, Saturday is a uh, 
Sedgwick County Association of, of Cities meeting. We don't normally have to attend those, of course, but uh, I have been attending them as often as possible. But we're we're actually sponsoring this one. It's going to be an exploration place Saturday. Starts at 8:30. They're asking for RSVPs by today, if possible, so they can kind of get a head count and have the, right, the food right. They do provide breakfast. Um, special speaker that day is Wampo Chair Pete Meinster. Um, but since uh, Sedgwick County is sponsoring the event that day, we're going to get a chance to be recognized and maybe say something. I don't know. So any commissioners that wants to show up or anybody else that elected for that matter wants to show up, my guess is you'll get a chance to say something. And it's pretty well attended. I'd say majority of the uh, cities are, are represented one way or the other, either through their council members or their mayors will show up. And so I'd recommend that uh, if you're not busy Saturday morning, please make that important to come to that meeting. It's, again, Exploration Place, 830 this weekend. Okay, thank you. thank you. Anything else? No. Mr. O'Donnell, sir. Okay. Okay, well, I guess I have got a couple things that I can get back up to speed. Um, first of all, I've seen some um, emails while I was gone about naming the Law Enforcement Training Center, where, where are we on that? And has a decision been made, or what are we doing? Uh, I think you had the, Commissioner Dennis had the latest information in terms of, I think the... Tanya and I toured it the other day. The last discussion I saw on email was to name the auditorium after uh, uh, Lemonian and Hill. And when I toured it the other day, I discovered there was no auditorium. Well, that makes it seems appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. But one thing I might suggest after tour in it uh, and taking a look at it, uh, there is a beautiful entryway as you come in uh, that's uh, going to have TVs and all kinds of stuff around there. We may want to put a plaque up in that entryway because that's where everybody's going to come in anyway and the only place that they would see it. And uh, just to say in honor of uh, uh, Police Chief Lemonian and Sheriff Hill or something along those lines. Okay, well, as, as a commission, expressed a consensus on what we want to do or I mean I just think it keeps going and there's assumptions that we're going forward with it but I didn't know if we'd ever discuss it. I um, my, I'm not a big fan of naming buildings but I don't mind naming the auditorium or the entry or classroom. I mean I think that's appropriate. Uh, uh, this, uh, this might be something that's the board that was set up uh, between Sheriff Easter and and um, Chief Ramsey, this may be something that that board needs to to actually make a decision on to bring to the council and commission. It seems like a perfect uh, opportunity and a topic for them to to be able to decide on. And so I'd say uh, let's kick it to them, and uh, and they'll bring you back a recommendation on what the appropriate uh, response should be. Or and I, I did talk to Mike Hill, uh, and he said he talked to, to Lemonian, and, and they do not want the building named after them. Uh, they want the building to be called the Wichita Sedgwick County Law Enforcement Training Center, uh, but they, they would be okay with naming, putting something inside of the building that uh, recognized their efforts on getting it there. So uh, that was the last, and, and I went straight to the source to <laughs> make sure that I knew what their concerns were. I, I'd also mention, and Sheriff's not here yet, but his dad was instrumental in that building as well. He was the very first WPD commander there, and I believe Gary Steep might have been the Sheriff's commander there. I'd have to double check that. But that would be also, they were at, uh, those were the guys out mowing the grass and getting everything set up, although, of course, the Sheriff and the Chief administrated it, but um, it's also would be appropriate for his father to be recognized too. So I just do some sort of pictorial history or something like they do in some places yeah. and the pictures well, and narrative and yeah. they kind of, right. you know. <coughs> so I guess we'll wait on a recommendation from the Joint Committee. Um, one other thing, um, I noticed that Margaret Miller passed away and um, I don't know how many of you all know her, but she was uh, born in my side uh, <laughs> from from way back at the beginning, but a really wonderful lady, and, and she and her husband both, and um, I, I think the commission should send a letter um, to her, you know, 
when she has a memorial service, did I see it was later this month, and uh, so that they could read it, the memorial service from the county commission, saying how much we've appreciated her service to the community and solid waste issues and recycling and so forth. So the commissioners don't have an objection because I mean, she's a special lady. She and her husband have been a long while for her to like me. <laughs> I'm not sure she really did. <laughs> Really a great, a great citizen. So we uh, want somebody to write a letter. Perfect. And um, I just got briefed on the lifting restrictions at Lake Afton and the Northeast Park. So I don't have a question about that anymore. And um, commissioners, anything to think? One more time. I noticed the sheriff's came in and he's full of wisdom and information. So. Mr. Manager, I'll throw it back to you. All right, so uh, I'll throw it to Sheriff. <laughs> Without further ado. Well, good morning. Is it getting ready to load up or? Yeah. Just double click on the. Ah, okay. Yep. Um, as several of you might uh, or might not know, um, the status of mental health care here uh, in uh, Kansas is kind of uh, in a flux. Uh, it's been an issue for quite some time, um, <coughs> and it's gotten to the point where, along with uh, Comcare, uh, Mr. Kaufman's here, um, we've been working with Comcare, uh, you know, you guys, uh, or three of you that are still here. Uh, approved the uh, mental health pod which has been a huge help to us it's been a, a very good conduit uh, with calm care uh, for individuals that uh, get out of jail still need uh, the assistance so that they'll come back to jail uh, and that uh, conduit with calm care has been a huge assistance the problem is is that we're inundated uh, with mental health care issues in this county uh, at this point uh, it's overloaded via Christie St. Joe uh, to the point where actually in uh, state statute, uh, part of state statute says that the hospitals can deny care uh, for mental health uh, treatment uh, folks. Uh, it is the state's responsibility and our responsibility. If they deny care, then ComCare uh, has to be the ones uh, to figure out where to place the individuals. Um, and ComCare doesn't have the bed space uh, nor the lockdown facility uh, inside Comcare. We were really concerned uh, last summer uh, through about the beginning of this winter um, that Via Christie might end up doing that. Uh, so last October uh, we made uh, uh, some inroads, uh, brought all the stakeholders together, uh, started discussing how <coughs> we can have an effect on health or mental health care here in Central County. Uh, and so we've had a series of meetings. What we decided to do <coughs> last year uh, in November, we invited a couple legislators uh, to come down to listen to our complaints, uh, listen to uh, the information that we have, uh, and pretty much all we got out of them is, uh, well, if you write some legislation, we'll introduce it. That's not what we were looking for. We we're looking for actually some assistance and guidance uh, and about the only bill that was really introduced last year on mental health care was uh, the fact that they couldn't, uh, uh, the state could not ask for an outside entity to come in to run the mental health hospital. Uh, so there was really nothing at the state level that, that they did. Osawatomi uh, has been almost, it's a little over two years now, and you might correct me on that, Kim. It's a little over two years now. Uh, that they have <coughs> uh, had this moratorium uh, which cuts down their bed space uh, and there's only about 110 or 140 beds uh, that is even available for the whole state of Kansas um, for folks to be taken up there. What else we found out was the state of Kansas, uh, uh, Osawatomie considers them acute care, not long-term care. So where do we put folks that have long-term issues. 
like years worth of treatment. They do 10 days up there and they come right back to our community and comp care deals with them. We deal with them uh, as soon as they get back. So a lot of issues. Um, we don't feel that we're getting any type of assistance from the state. Uh, and so September 25th, uh, we'll be having a combined uh, with Via Christi, Wesley, the Wichita Police Department, Tom, Karen, ourselves uh, are going to be putting on um, PowerPoint presentations. I'm going to show you ours today. Uh, Comcare has a, a very good and in-depth one too of what they're facing and uh, show them exactly what's taking place here in Sedgwick County. Uh, you're more than welcome to come. It's at Via Christi St. Joe. If you're interested, let me know uh, and I can send you something on your calendar. Um, but basically, uh, we'll, we'll have that go on, feed them lunch, and then there's three tours that they're available to go on. Uh, that's either with Comcare, uh, us, um, or via Christi uh, St. Joe campus. Thus far we've had 11 legislators sign up and only one sign up for a tour. So what we're going to go over is just basic numbers uh, for inside uh, the facility. These numbers will change a little bit. Um, I gave this presentation to somebody else in August and so uh, as of today we're down to 219 inmates out of county. Uh, you've seen some of this before, but we want to make sure that they understand the costs related uh, with our medical care uh, that takes place uh, in inside the facility, um, how many nurse visits, how many doctor visits, how many mental health visits, and those mental health visits also don't count uh, for what takes place in the mental health pod because that's um, about 16 hours worth of service. Uh, six days a week that goes on in, inside the mental health uh, care uh, or mental health pod. 350 inmates or 25 percent of our inmate population is diagnosed with some form of mental illness, experiencing a significant increase in drug-induced mental illness. I think you've heard me talk about that before. Methamphetamine is the big uh, drug now uh, in Cedric County, uh, not cocaine. Uh, right now uh, you can buy a kilo of methamphetamine for $6,300. Uh, that is very, very cheap. Um, cocaine is roughly about 19000 a kilo. And so methamphetamine, because it's man-made, made out of Drano, red pea, uh, phosphorus from ammonia, or uh, I'm sorry, ammonia, um, all of those things burns holes in you, uh, and it burns holes in the brain. So it emulates mental health issues when they maybe have never been diagnosed with a mental health issue until after they've become hooked on uh, methamphetamine and it burned holes in their brain and they never get that back. Yeah. Yes? Uh, before the, the 350 inmates have diagnosed with a mental problem and then that's plus the 29% that you think have mental health Yeah, an additional 400% we believe have not, are suspected. They have signs of mental health okay. uh, issues. Um, and they're not given the same type of medications. The 350 inmates, they're on like the psychotropics, the medications, they're getting the additional care. Um, some of these folks are hard to diagnose sometimes because they're just behavioral issues. Um, but embedded in them is also alcoholism, drug abuse, and mental health issues. So sometimes it's, it's hard to vet out the four to see which one they actually have a problem with. Okay, so it's more like 54% have some sort of mental health issue varying degrees. Correct. Okay. Okay. Correct. Um, approximately 1,000 or 73% of the inmates have a chemical dependency, uh, and a vast majority with mental illness also have a dual diagnosis of chemical dependency. Inside the facility, comprehensive mental health services include an initial uh, mental health evaluation. All inmates get that. Uh, we have individualized treatment plans, brief solution focused therapy, group therapy sessions, psych education, medication management, discharge planning, and case management. But we're not a treatment facility. <coughs> yeah, that's the issue. Um, we try really hard not to say we're a treatment facility because we're not supposed to be, but that's a treatment facility which we shouldn't be inside the jail. And so that's that's. $750,000 a year, the county is contributing to this, okay, for the mental health stuff, because now it, it, we have to. But that $750,000 that, uh, if you look at it from strictly a budget budget management issue, 
we never see back okay and so I think locally here we are really taking the burden uh, and in fact that's what the state has done has shoved down that burden to the local <coughs> period that's why we've had to do some of the things that we've done that's why you've had to to uh, fund com care a little bit more uh, because it, it is it is a huge problem here Inmates who are identified by medical or detention staff who are in need of mental health care are referred to mental health uh, professionals to determine the level of care that is needed. An initial mental health evaluation is completed by qualified mental health professionals, including a master level social workers uh, and psychologist. A referral is made based on the outcome of the evaluation. Those who are prescribed medications are seen for follow-up as the provider deems necessary. Those inmates who present with a need for a higher level of care are referred for placement in the mental health management unit. They are seen by a qualified mental health professional on a regular basis, and they are seen by the psychiatric team. Both group therapy and activity therapy services are offered. Have, have you all taken a tour of the mental health pod? So you've, you've all seen it? Okay. So there's step-down units um, where folks that we have uh, basically, if they're not in, in uh, therapy, and those folks have to be individual therapy, um, then they're locked down. Uh, in, unless they're eating or sharing, they got to be out by themselves because they're they're that bad. Um, and then we step down from there. What we thought we would see is through the step down unit uh, is the final unit. We would get them back acclimated uh, to reality uh, and then acclimated to the general jail population, so that we could put them back out in general population. Um, we're not seeing that. Uh, when we have tried to put them back out in general population, this is the a uh, group that uh, doesn't um, uh, work well with others. They get picked on, they're victimized, uh, they cause a lot of issues, disruption. Um, we've seen about a 28% decrease in our use of forces inside the facility once we went to this pod. So one thing that we thought we would get out of this is more people coming through the mental health pod. That's one thing that we're not seeing. Um, most folks are in there until they're released from jail. Inmates who present with suicidal ideations or a history of suicide attempts within the last year are placed on suicide watch and housed in the clinic. This level of care is also used when inmates are in acute crisis. Inmates are seen daily by qualified mental health professionals who focus on assisting the inmate with returning to their baseline level of functioning. This can include brief solution focused therapy, coping skill building, and pharmaceutical intervention. When the mental health unit was formed, a process was put into place with ComCare to streamline the process when an inmate is released from custody. This entails ComCare completing paperwork prior to the inmate release and the inmate patient being transported straight to ComCare for treatment or to another local facility for treatment. The reason this takes place is due to once an inmate is booked into jail, the state of Kansas spends all Medicare and Medicaid uh, and they have to be re-enrolled once released. One of the things that, that we found uh, when I first came into office uh, was once we released them, ComCare couldn't see them. And so we would give them what, maybe three to five days worth of medication to hopefully keep them medicated so that and it was about a two week to a month turnaround before ComCare could get them in their doors to see them to, because it took two weeks to re-enroll them in Medicaid. Um, and so what was happening is these folks would never return for their appointment. Uh, they'd never show up, uh, and then it was just a revolving door because they'd come right back to jail. So what we do now is, is, is these individuals, we transport straight to ComCare. ComCare comes in about two weeks prior to when we know they're going to be released, um, and they start the paperwork. So as soon as they leave our doors, they're taken straight to ComCare. They're already re-enrolled, so there's a payment process in place. Um, when they're taken to ComCare. And from that point, some of them uh, then are transported to local hospitals. Uh, some of them are treated on site and some of them are released back out in the community, but with a plan from ComCare, which before didn't happen. So it's been a very good uh, process. One of the things uh, that we just want to point out, the state of Kansas pauses the medical card for up to 45 days, which is a possible solution to some of this problem. Um, Again, what we're talking about there, as soon as somebody comes into jail, they lose all benefits if they're there uh, for about 10 days. If they're there less than 10 so if you're booked there overnight, you lose nothing. Uh, but if they're there for around 10 days, then they lose uh, the Medicare stuff. 
Now that's something that we just want to point out. Um, I'm not saying that that's something that, that needs to happen here. Um, number of transports of inmates and patients uh, from January 2016 to May of 2017, uh, we transported 549 uh, total transports. Uh, from 1-1-16 to 4-30 of 17, a total of 12, uh, 467 patients, uh, inmates were seen by the uh, clinic. I don't, that's a typo there. It should have been a total of 467. On average, 779 patients or inmates were seen per month. Uh, the visits consist of new patient visits, follow-up visits, psychiatric nurse visits, mental health screens, special needs contacts, segregation rounds, group therapy sessions, and discharge planning contacts. This is part of the problem as well. Uh, Larner, we have a lot of individuals that are sitting in our facility uh, that have to have competency hearings before uh, they can go uh, to a prelim or to trial. And what this is showing us is, is that um, we're having um, wait lists that just are not um, good for us or the court system because everything's delayed at the point that the judge orders a competency hearing and we're seeing a lot more of those take place. So just in May of this year we had 17 people waiting on that list. Uh, average wait time for those individuals was 67 days. The longest we had was 128 days um, and as you can tell by the numbers on the left hand column the, the folks that are waiting compared to the inmates that actually were sent out uh, was a long delay um, and that's gotten worse uh, because of the issues at the state system with Larnard. Um, part of the reason Larnard moved some of their uh, patients to El Dorado, which if you've seen the news, El Dorado's having a lot of issues, El Dorado prison, uh, was because they moved a large amount of mental health patients or mental health uh, prisoners to um, El Dorado from Larnard to free up some space so that these competency hearings can take place a little bit quicker. So they tried to maybe assist on one issue which created another larger issue within their own system. From 1-1-17 to 5517, uh, we transported six people to Osawatomie ourselves. We use Apple Bus as our transport, but some of these folks are uh, so bad uh, that Apple Bus will not transport them. Um, we had 104 Apple bus transports to Osawatomie. That's a combination of what Comcare sends to Osawatomie and ourselves. We transported uh, 75 people to Larnard. Civil care and treatment orders received was 729. Civil care and treatment orders served was 631. Civil care and treatment pickup orders was three. Civil care and tr treatment pickup orders served was two. What civil care and treatment orders are is something that that's, uh, goes through the DA's office because folks need to be um, picked up, committed, those type of things. So as you can see in that four month period, uh, we had a lot of care and treatment orders, uh, 729. And those are folks that touch the system. These are not private folks that um, we deal with on a daily basis where we transport them to either Calm Care, and right now it's mainly Via Christi St. Joe that, that is used. Patrol Division responds to several locations in the city of Wichita that cares for mentally ill patients, blows a breakdown of those locations. Because these are county-owned facilities, the Sedgwick County Sheriff's Office is the one that uh, uh, responds to those particular calls. Uh, as you can see, there's a breakdown, 635 North Main, which is the main calm care location. Uh, during this time frame, four months, we made 1,072 calls to 635 North Main. That's a lot of calls, folks, at one location. Uh, and then these are the other ones that we have to respond to as well. Total calls for service for four and a half months was 1,287 calls. And those are all related to mental health. When a case is made by the deputy in the field on a mentally ill patient, record staff is required to enter each case in the computer and then provide the case electronic, electronic, electronically to the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. On average, each case takes 30 minutes to enter. Remember when we said we were short on staff? <laughs> and asked for more staff in the records division, this is what's contributing to it as well. As you can see, the cases that are made, roughly it takes 30 minutes a case to make them or to enter them in the computer. 
Total of 949 cases have been entered into our record system. That's total hours spent of 474.5 hours just on these particular cases. In 2016, we had two inmates that were very violent, were released on their charges. They had commitment papers and were taken to Via Christie to house until Osawatomi had a bed opening. One of the things that we discussed with the legislators last year, as soon as um, that person is released, I can no longer have anything to do with them. Uh, their criminal charges are over. Uh, I can actually be charged by state statute uh, for confining that person. And so they have to be out of my custody immediately. The problem is, is that there's really no place to take our really violent ones. And we had two that were extremely violent. Um, they were taken to Via Christi St. Joe, where they assaulted the nurses, the doctors, and that's even with us standing there uh, before we could get on top of them. Because in a hospital setting, because they're not in our custody, I can't handcuff them to the table. And so in the time frame in between trying to settle them down and get them into a bed, now the hospitals can, can um, restrain them if they believe that they're, they're a uh, threat. But in between that time, they can't be. And that's when they assaulted nurses and doctors. This is the, the part that Via Christi became very upset about because they're having uh, Wichita Police Department come in nonstop and um, dropping patients off at Via Christie. At one point, they had 18 mental health patients standing in the hallways waiting to be seen um, with very little police presence around. And if you've been to Via Christie, their ER is right here and their four room for mental health care is right here. So they're housed right next to uh, their ER rooms, which is causing a lot of issues for them. Neither of these patients inmates should have been taken to Via Christie because they could not handle them. However, by state law, the sheriff's office cannot hold them due to not being in our custody. We were looking at some, some type of legislation that if we identify that this person is too violent because of their mental health status to be inside the hospital, that we would hold them until Osawatomie could take them. <coughs> because basically that's what Via Christie's being used as. Um, and they're not equipped nor, in my opinion, should they be taking these folks. Central County SO has 220 uh, deputies trained in CIT, that's uh, our mental health training. Osawatomie considers themselves to be an acute care and not a long care, long term care uh, facility. When I talked to some legislators over the phone about this, they had no idea. And so, our long term care patients, um, they're not keeping more than 10 days. So, where is it that we've we house these folks at. And I know we have, you know, different special interest groups and stuff saying, well, they, they shouldn't just be housed somewhere. Well, some folks, I'm sorry, do not belong in society. They need long-term treatment. And that could be for the rest of their life. Where in Kansas does long-term care go? Right now, back to our communities. With the change in state uh, policy, moving mentally in, mentally ill inmates to El Dorado, is there going to be an increase of mentally ill parolees coming to Wichita? That's a question we have for them. Because we're the only place close to El Dorado that has the facilities or has uh, the treatment uh, facilities that we have. So folks that are from Kansas City area, from that are, that are the, uh, El Dorado is the max prison uh, for the state. And so, you know, you're talking 10 year plus inmates that are going to be in there, but after 10 years, where are they going to be paroled to? That's a big question for us because it's going to strain our already strained system because they're probably going to be paroled here because of their mental health issues. Cedric County SO is overwhelmed along with our partners. Osawatomie has been on a moratorium for over two years. Larner is backlogged with clogs, that, which clogs the court system. Uh, we need state legislators to recognize the issues we face locally and meet with this group of professionals to come up with solutions to this ever-growing problem. And then, of course, ComCare has their uh, own presentation with stats and, and uh, what they're facing. The one that's really powerful, uh, to be honest with you, is the Via Christie one. Um, because they've been the de facto mental health care treatment uh, facility since I became on the department. Uh, they have a lockdown facility, but they've also um, shut down parts of their uh, mental health treatment. And so, uh, as you, if you don't know the history, the state started years ago when they started shutting down mental health hospitals. And Osawatomie literally is about the only one left. Larner's for the kind of criminally insane, 
uh, and then also for uh, the uh, competency hearing. So um, something has to be done. Either the state needs to be shoving more money here if they're going to shove this down locally. Our opinion is the state needs to give us the money to, to affect these issues. Uh, or they need to look at building a new facility, which now we're hearing that they're, they're talking about doing that. Uh, they're also talking about putting this out uh, to bid for uh, some outside entity to come in and do mental health care. I don't know how you feel about that, but for me personally, um, I have no opinion either way. Do something. Do something to assist us with this ever-growing problem. Um, because I, personally, I, don't, I think we've done plenty. We've been working on this issue. 15, 16 years now, uh, when we started in with ComCare, uh, the police departments and stuff here locally in the sheriff's office, working with ComCare to come up with, with solutions. Because what we're also seeing is, because there's so much of it, we're seeing, um, and I don't want to make this a tip for tap, but what we're seeing is the police department who's inundated with calls is bringing in mental health patients, dropping them off at the front door and leaving, because that's a county problem. So then it becomes a community uh, a calm care problem and our problem when they're actually city of Wichita residents and so that's been going on about two or three years now but it's progressively getting worse because there's so many that we're dealing with so but they have no place else to take them. no they, they have to take them there but they should be staying with them not just dropping them off at the front door via Christy and calm care they are their responsibility we we're working out those issues with the police department and, and they agree with that, but they got, sometimes they're still having people just drop them off, um, which then causes us to come in, causes ComCare to go, why are you here? Uh, those type of things. Um, you, you gave the number of 1,158 your total bed space. Mm -hmm. uh, does that include the double bunking that we did a few years ago? Inside the facility, yes. And what is there, 90? Yes. And what was the total number that you had on one of the early slides about uh, how much our medical costs are? Was that, um, did that include the mental health costs? Well, it's it's a when we talk about the medical statistics, what we're talking about there is is in fifteen um, we had eighteen patients and. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is is that a lot of the, the folks coming into jail haven't been to a doctor, haven't had medical care in years. And so they are got a lot of issues when they come into the facility. Because we are mandated to, to treat individuals, we treat them for everything. Which means a lot of hospital care, a lot of outpatient care. Um, two weeks ago we had three people on uh, kidney dialysis, which means they have to go three times a week, uh, which is two deputies. Uh, for each one that goes, that's a four-hour process. Um, and so a lot of our resources are being used up getting these folks to treatment for different issues. This here, we had 18 patients that cost us $570,000, okay, which included their hospitalization. Um, fortunately, we did receive the Medicare rate because if we didn't, those 18 patients would have cost us um, $5.3 my budget last year for medical care alone was 5.3 million. 18 patients would have went through that if we didn't get uh, the Medicare rates or Medicaid rates. Um, and so that's what we're trying to point out is, is that uh, the fact that um, Medicare, Medicaid rates helps us, the county, maintain our costs. Um, and uh, we have very sick inmates. I mean, we had one inmate that, that uh, he was costing us 8,000 8, a week. Well, the 5.6 million for total medical costs that includes mental health. Yes, it does. I'm sorry. If that's your question, that includes the $750,000 for uh, the mental health pod and the additional mental health treatment that we provide. Yes. <coughs> Any other questions? So, what's the silver bullet? What's the solution? Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, the, the, the two things that, that, and I've talked to legislators, um, we have got to look at incarceration 
uh, differently in my opinion. Uh, right now, uh, if and, and drugs run, cause most of the crime. I would say 90 to 95% of the crime is because it's drug related. Uh, because they got a habit, almost all burglaries, larcenies, those type of things is to support their drug habit. Right now, uh, depending on what their, their record is, first time burglars do not go to prison. Second time burglars don't go to prison, convicted. It takes a third conviction for them to go to prison. My opinion is, is that we have got to look at, instead of building a <coughs> prison, they need to build a very large treatment facility and give those judges the opportunity on those first time offenses, when they have drug issues, that, okay, I can't sentence you to prison, but I can sentence you to a year in treatment or two years in treatment so that we can maybe get a handle on the treatment issue which will drive down our uh, crime numbers because we're getting some folks into treatment instead of letting them right back out just to start the whole cycle again. I think that's gotta be part of the solution. If we can get a handle on the treatment aspect with the mental health stuff, I think we might see a reduction in some of our mental health care patients because of the methamphetamine epidemic that we're in right now because it emulates mental health issues. Um, and the state, when it comes to um, the mental health aspect, I think there's two options. They either build a brand new facility, which they're talking about, which is much bigger than Osawatomie, um, or they provide the money here locally for us to do it. That's the two things that, that, that I'm gonna suggest. Okay. None of them are inexpensive solutions. None of them are inexpensive, but I'm also not coming to you for the money. Because at some point, what is the state's responsibility on this? I mean, I'm asking you guys. But do, you, do you believe the state has a responsibility for this? Well, we could probably figure out some way to partner with them if we thought we had some ongoing operational support for the state. Well, you know, and one of the things that we're looking at, you know, those are little fixes for smaller issues. When I was asking, hey, can we house these individuals um, until Osawatomie gets fed because they, they cannot go to um, be a Christian. But how many patients are we talking about? That's, that's a little fix to hopefully keep people from getting hurt. Um, we gotta look for, for bigger fixes and we have to look for uh, ways to partner with the state. Um, I, you know, that, that's, it, it's very frustrating for all the individuals involved and we probably have about 25 stakeholders that are involved in this now. Um, and we're all seeing the same thing. And we're all dealing with the same people over and over and over again. Now that does cost us money. That costs us money through Comfair, that costs us money through gelling services, uh, some of the other programs that the county help fund. Commissioners, any questions, comments? Great way to start the week. <laughs> I'm not here to be the bearer of bad news. Just, uh, this is an issue we've been dealing with for two years, and I don't know if we've been taken seriously on it. So. Thanks for the information. Thank you. Manager, anything else? I think, uh, I think that's it. Okay. Commissioners, uh, give me one more time. Just a real quick uh, reminder that Zubilee is a Saturday night. And uh, the other important thing this month is it's the 70th anniversary of the United States Air Force on September the 18th. So, I want to make everybody recognizes they split off from that other branch and they're now one of the finest organizations in the United States. <laughs> well, let's, let's go if we have an interagency fight here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, David. Anything else? Uh, anything from the rest of the staff this morning that um, you need to tell us to make us better? Well, I just want to announce a couple of events this week at the NCAT Thursday. There at 8:30, or we have a couple of people from Johnson County coming down to tell us how they handle drainage projects, how they pay for them, the process they use to prioritize. And 
that sort of thing. It's an all-day event, but the, the we're, 12 cities have signed up so far as of this morning out of the 20 in the county. So I'm hoping to get some more. The larger ones are all signed up, but um, so that. And then the other thing, the uh, contamination of the water, that public meeting is Thursday night at 6 o'clock. And down Hayesville, uh, it's at some alternative school. I can't, Stewart, I think it's something like that. Sure. And so that's, that's a big event. And uh, that's about it. Okay, thanks, David. Anyone else? Okay, how about our other elected officials? Um, anything? All right. Um, that being the case, we can be adjourned.